Namaste, and welcome to a new series with our beloved Ranga on Savitri. Savitri for me these past 61 years has been my way. From the first book that was given to me by A.B. Purani, I shall never forget reading those first lines of Savitri. And we have truly a momentous and auspicious moment on this New Year's Eve to begin Savitri with Ranga. Before we start reading the text, I think we should know something about Savitri's background. So we'll just have a, a brief discussion, maybe not very brief also. The story of Savitri is not Srivandu's original story. He has taken it from the Mahabharata and it's an episode. It's a, it is inserted into the Mahabharata text in 300 verses and it's a story of conjugal love. Srivandu has used the, um, the poem uh, for his own purpose. He has given it a total new meaning. It's not a story of any more of conjugal love, but he has turned it into a, a symbol. It's a legend which he has turned it into a symbol. So later on, in the subtitling, there is a legend and a symbol, and he has used it as a symbol. A symbol of what? <laughs> the symbol of the, in the Mahabharata text itself, Savitri is fighting with death, Yama. And she wins back her husband. So this is a symbol even in Savitri, in uh, the Mahabharata of the conquest of death. So this is what Srimla has used in his poem representing the conquest of death. But is it only death? It is all the imperfections in the physical world. So it's actually he has used it as just one element in his concept of the supramental, supramentalization of the earth consciousness. So it was very, very um, uh, useful for him to use this text which is already there representing the conquest of death and now he has given it a totally different meaning. It is not only conquest of death, but it is a conquest of falsehood, of evil, of suffering and all this. So. He has used that and he has used Savitri as an experiment. It began as an experiment for him. When he was in Baroda, when he was in Baroda, he started and he was looking into all the Indian texts, uh, the Mahabharata, Ramayana and all the Upanishads and all that. And he found them very, very interesting. So, he was reading all these and the Stories where there is death and there is, um, there, he has got a love and death is also a poem which he wrote, he says, in, um, in a white hot, uh, white hot heat of inspiration, he says. It came out completely and I think, I don't remember the time, in one week or something like that, he wrote it out. Did it, pre it preceded Savitri? Yes. And there also, there is the Ruru and he has changed the names there. That also is a story from the uh, Indian classics. But he has changed the names there and Ru, Ru, Ruru and Priyambada. He has changed Pramadhura to Priyambada which is more pronounceable and more easy. So there also one of them is willing to give up half his life so that death can be postponed. <laughs> So there, this idea of conquest of death has been there with him right from the beginning. <laughs> and then finally, in Savitri, he has done it. Now, he used Savitri as an experiment to see, to verify his ascension in consciousness. Every time he went to a different level of consciousness, he rewrote the first um, uh, canto 
to see how what difference it would make in the physical world the connection between the inspiration the spiritual planes of consciousness and its effect in the physical world and i believe one day you told me he rewrote 50 times that's right there are 50 versions 50 of the of canto 1 of canto 1 <laughs> so that is what he has done and it is also worth mentioning that savitri is the longest epic in english poetry and literature and the longest epic 24000 lines nobody has written more than that milton and all the others have written epics but not this length and true to the construction of an epic he has divided savitri into three parts and each part has divided into books and each book into cantos there is usually the structure of an epic you have different parts and then you have the um, the uh, the book there are 12 books in savitri each book containing several cantos and each time the number of cantos varies from each book so he has, this is what he has done and it is incomplete it's worth mentioning that savitri is incomplete just like life divine uh, sorry uh, synthesis of yoga he could not complete it's such a vast plan he had that he ran short of time and in fact towards the end of his life he was hurrying up to finish savitri when he asked towards the end 19 his uh, life in pondicherry has been divided into many many um, uh, you mean periods in the first period for instance when he came he was intensely concentrating because he was out of the uh, revolutionary movement in fact very few people knew that he was in pondicherry so he was concentrating walking 7 8 hours a day in concentration his concentration was not in his in a seated position he used to walk and concentrate and he used to walk in such a way that he was not aware of the surroundings that's again another story but if i go into that it'll take some time he used to walk and sometimes he used to bang into furniture and there was some problem with his where he was hitting the furniture every time there seemed to be some sort of um, skin problem so mother had to call a doctor and that whole episode we have published in mother india and the doctor flew came all the way from north india and he looked at sir and said that no he started walking with sir and sir and was not conscious that he is walking with him and he found that he is knocking into furniture so he told mother it's not a skin problem at all it is just that he is knocking into the mm, furniture so mother said what to do i don't know what to do but next day she removed those pieces of furniture which were likely to obstruct him and they think got the skin problem disappeared by itself because no treatment was given to him so he was so so concentrated my point is he was so concentrated while walking that he is not even aware that the doctor is walking with him to see what's happening could you talk a little bit about the footprints that he left in the the, the footprints he left in the wood yeah that was in uh, in the guest house yes he used to this walking he used to do 7 hours 6 7 hours 8 hours he used to go on walking with concentrating that he left his footprints on the floor of the guest house that place where he lived in the guest house is still preserved nobody lives there his pictures are kept and it is kept as a, a shrine there are people who live in the other rooms but not in this guest house so many people come and visit that room but unfortunately that floor has been changed and they have they thought that the floor was not decent enough so they put tiles and all that but in the process the footprints are not there <laughs> so that's right so after 1945 one day he asked deruddha was the one his eyes started becoming dim with cataract okay so he started dictating he used to dictate and neruddha was the 
uh, one who is to take down his dictation. So towards the end of uh, he, uh, in 1950, towards the end of his life, he asked the Nirada one day, "What are the things which you have to complete?" Because he knew what had to be completed and all that. So Nirada told him that the book of death is still to be done, <laughs> and he said, "Oh, that we shall see later on." And then he came to the book of fate. There is a last piece of writing which he has given, where he says that mother has to uh, face Savitri. Actually, not mother, but I'll come to that. Savitri has to face the the crisis in her life, where one decision, either she has to fall or she will bring about a a huge change in the world. So those are the last pieces which he has dictated. Amal had written about that yes. in his fifty-four That's edition. Right. I think the words began with, "As a star uncompanioned moves in heaven." That's right. Unastonished by the immensities of space. Yeah. So now the question arises: whether Savitri is autobiographical. So this is a very interesting question. You can identify Savitri with the mother, because that's work that she did. Mother also did the same work. She brought down the super mantle, which is the beginning of the conquest of death. And what about Sriram? Though is he Satyavan? Satyavan in the um, in the um, in the story as well as in the poem is rather a passive role. So actually, Sriram Do's autobiographical part is Ashwapati and his yoga. So it is not absolutely autobiographical in that sense, but it is autobiographical in another sense. Okay. So, but definitely Ashwapati's experiences are all Sriram Do's experiences. If you read the synthesis and all that, you will see that he is describing his own experiences through Ashwapati, the king. Ashwapati is the father of Savitri, and he is praying to the Divine Mother. And the divine mother grants him. He says, "You will get a daughter who will change the destiny of the world." So that is the. And then, this, so this, there are three parts. The first part is a book of the traveler of the worlds. Okay, book one, book two, book three also is traveler of the worlds. So this is the experiences of Sri Ramdo. Then there is the. Book uh, the second part. Sorry, this is part one and part two. Part two is the meeting of Satyavan and Savitri and the development there. And the last bit, part three, is the fight with Yama, the argument and the debate with death and the consequences of what happens. She brings Sav- uh, Satyavan back to earth. <coughs> this is the Plan that he has done. So it is a. As I said, there are twelve, three parts, twelve books, and any number of cantos, um, varying from book to book. So this is the background to Savitri. Also, one more thing you must remember: Savitri is not to be confused with Savitri. Savitri is a son. Savitri is the daughter of the son. Just as in the Gayatri mantra, okay, the Gayatri mantra, which Sri Ramdev has slightly modified himself, okay. So the Gayatri mantra goes like this: Tat Savitur Varenyam Bhargo Devasya Dhimahi Dhiyo Yona Prachodayat. So this is the uh, the uh, so the here. Savitur Varem. It is referring to the sons, okay. And Sri Ramdev has translated that in a slightly different way. He has given his own Gayatri mantra. I need not go into that, but I can just read it out what Sri Ramdev has written. He has changed it slightly. Om Tat Savitur Varem Rupam Jyotihi Parasya Dhimahi Yanna Satyen Dhipayet. The meaning is more or less the same, but he has changed the words. I don't know exactly why he has done that, but obviously he found it necessary. He has done it. Let us meditate on that most auspicious form of the sun, whose light. Let us meditate on that light, 
which will illumine us with truth. This is what it means. Basically, the same meaning also is there in the other one. Om Tat Savitur Varenyam, the most auspicious. Bargo, Bargo is light. light. Deva Siddhima. Let us meditate on the light of the divine, which Dhyo Yona Prachutayat, which will illumine our minds. Dhyo is mind, which will impel us towards the truth. So, not to be confused, Savitri is the father of Savitri. So, sometimes. Uh, you may get confused, so you have to be very clear about that. So this is Savitri, the daughter of the sun. So now the first part is the, as we have said, the book of beginnings. So Shyamdu's uh, Savitri is on a tremendously vast scale. He is talking of the beginning of evolution and the end of evolution as, as conceived of now. The end of evolution would be the divinization of matter. So this is what Savitri is. It begins with the inconscient producing the world and then ending with the divinization of the world. So this is the whole, you can imagine the uh, grand... Uh, grandiose grandiosity if you want the grandiosity of the whole theme it's a very vast theme so so the first canto is the symbol dawn that is the beginning of creation so we'll read that today okay good and one thing I remembered that I, I believe it was Nirod Baran, uh, that when Sri Aurobindo asked him what remained to be done, yeah. it was also Book 12. Yeah. He, and he said, we'll see about that later. Yeah. He also mentioned uh, the Book of Death. And Book of Death is incomplete. Yes. Canto 1 and Canto 2 have not been written. It's almost as though, because everything is based on his own experience. So, it almost sounds like, let me get that experience and then I will write about it. <laughs> canto 1 and Canto 2 on the Book of Death, not written. <laughs> and very short Canto 3. Yes, because there is only one Canto 3. Yes. It's the death of Satyavan. So, <clears throat> it's not easy to read Savitri and... You will excuse me if I sometimes make some mistakes. And what I am going to read is one edition. There is another edition also. And um, many changes have been made there. And there is a, there was a lot of controversy and all that. Those things have died down. They have added a lot of commas okay, in the text for meaning's sake. Sremdo use of commas was extremely rare even in his prose. So we have to often provide a comma so that we understand what he is saying. Because he, his inspiration was so rapid, <laughs> no commas, only full stops. <laughs> I do have a story about Prithvi Singh Nahar, who typed out the life divine on a typewriter, being legally blind. And he wrote to Sri Aurobindo, you're not using enough commas. And Sri Aurobindo sent something back full of commas. He said, is that, <laughs> is that enough now? Is that sufficient? <laughs> Yeah. Prithi Singh was one of those who could decipher Sri Ramdo's handwriting. Yes. <laughs> he was very good at that. <clears throat> okay. This first canto is quite long. It's about uh, nine, ten pages. Okay. It's ten pages. So, obviously, we will not be able to, I think, each session, if we do one page. Agree. <laughs> it'll be, it, it depends on what, uh, how much we yes. have to see. Some, uh, we may go sometimes to two pages also. But anyway, another thing I should mention that Savitri is mantric. It's a mantra. And what is a mantra? <laughs> 
the mantra is a sound which has constructive powers all sound can create or destroy <clears throat> beautiful music can create it is conducive to growth we have seen that even the plants when music is played to them they become healthy and they respond and sound can also be destructive when supersonic jets fly over a town they can smash window panes so sound is a very powerful thing now this sound a mantra is a sound which is always conducive to growth so savitri it is recommended should be read aloud okay so that it has and mother has said several times it's not necessary to understand savitri mentally she is not saying don't understand she is not saying that of course if you understand you will is much better but there should not be a struggle with the mind to understand savitri even if you don't understand it will have its effect but of course if you understand it so much the better so let's start reading the symbol dawn canto 1 the symbol dawn it was the hour before the gods awake across the path of the divine event the huge foreboding mind of night alone in her unlit temple of eternity lay stretched immobile upon silence march almost one felt opaque impenetrable in the somber symbol of her eyeless muse the abysm of the unbodied infinite a fathomless zero occupied the world a power of fallen boundless self awake between the first and the last nothingness recalling the tenebrous womb from which it came turned from the insoluble mystery of birth and the tardy process of mortality and long to reach its end in vacant naught as in a dark beginning of all things a mute featureless semblance of the unknown repeating forever the unconscious act prolonging forever the unseeing will cradled the cosmic drowse of ignorant force whose moved creative slumber kindles the suns and carries our lives in its somnambulist whirl a thwart the vain enormous trance of space its formless stupor without mind or life a shadow spinning through a soulless void thrown back once more into unthinking dreams earth wheeled abandoned in the hollow gulfs forgetful of her spirit and her fate the impassive skies were neutral empty still then something in the inscrutable darkness stirred a nameless movement an unthought idea insistent dissatisfied without a name something that wished but knew not how to be teased the inconscient to wake ignorance so we look at the words he is using and he is describing the beginning of creation how from the inconscient which is a negation of the divine it is the opposite of the divine it is darkness it is absolutely dead there is no life no mind nothing at all and from there life slowly comes out so <clears throat> it was the hour before the gods awake he is not saying before the gods awoke he is saying before the gods awake <clears throat> 
So it's not something in time. It is something eternal. It is outside time. Otherwise, he would have said it was the hour before the gods awoke. <laughs> but it's awake. So it is something that continues. It's the symbol dawn. Okay. So the very first canto of the, uh, the symbol dawn. The dawn is the night changing into light. That's a dawn. So night is the inconscient and the birth of the creation from there is the beginning of light, beginning of life. So, so this is the description that he is giving. It's a dawn. <clears throat> okay. So, it was the hour before the gods awake. In other words, the beginning of creation. Across the path of the divine event, the huge foreboding mind of night alone in her unlit temple of eternity. So, let's look at this. The huge foreboding mind of night. There is a mind, but it is darkness. So, <clears throat> it's involved. Okay. In her, is that, that's why it's foreboding. Yes, that's right. Foreboding, uh, to board is to have omens. It bodes ill, if you say. It means that it's going to end badly. It's an omen. It's a verb that describes omen. Okay? Um, it can be good or bad. So, foreboding. Thinking of something which is going to happen. Mind of night alone in her unlit temple of eternity. I'll read out all the words which suggest the, in, uh, the inconscient. Okay? So, Okay, I'll write, write it out just now. This is the description of the inconscient. Unlit, no light. Immobile, no movement. Opaque, lack of light. Somber, dark. Impenetrable, thick and very, very dense. Okay, Eyeless, there is no vision there. Abysm, again a chasm. Okay. Unbodied, there is no form at all. Okay, zero, fathomless, infinite. The inconscient is infinite. Boundless, there is no bound to it. Nothingness. I am reading all these words. I am putting them all together to show you that it is the inconscient. Tenebrous womb. So it's a darkness, but it's a womb. It will produce something. It's a womb, tenebrous womb, unconscious, unseeing, trance, stupor, formless, shadow, okay, soulless, no soul there, no divine, void, slumber, somnambulist. So these are all the words he has used. <laughs> I've listed them out here to show you that he is talking of the inconscient. But he is suggesting that the inconscient there is a chance of producing life because it's a womb and also it's a temple. It may be dark, but it's a temple. And what's a temple? The, the divinity is hidden in the temple. So these are the suggestions that he is giving. It was the hour before the gods awake across the path of the divine event. Okay. Event, he has put an E cap. Yes. So it's an event, not an event in the physical world, not something transient. It is the greatest event that you can think of, the creation of the world. E cap, note that. Is it what a meaning? Yes, yes. It's not any one event. It is the event. <laughs> That's what is implied. The huge foreboding mind of night alone. Again, nothing is there. In our unlit temple of eternity, so it is unlit, it is dark, the inconscient, but it's yet a temple. Lay stretched, immobile, no movement at all, upon silence marge. Okay, the, all these the, words are... The edge of silence? Yes, marge. <laughs> silence marge, because from there will come out the silence will come into vibration. So life will come up, marge. <clears throat> Almost one felt opaque, impenetrable, 
in the somber symbol of her eyeless muse so although it's inconscient it's a muse there's a hidden godhead there but it is eyeless no vision temi used to tell me that it did not mean blind it meant without the power of sight yes visionless vision that's right yes <clears throat> that's right the abysm of the unbodied infinite so no forms there it is infinite and it's an abysm this description is detailed about the inconscient every adjective that is using is a inconscient about to produce the universe a power of fallen boundless self awake between the first and the last nothingness so which is the first nothingness and the last nothingness the first nothingness could be the inconscient and the last nothingness is light but featureless if it is featureless you can consider it as nothingness that's the experience of the self so here also it's a nothing it's a negative nothing and at the highest level it's a positive nothing it has he speaks of a power here. yes that's what right what is that power <laughs> yeah. of fallen boundless self the boundless yeah fallen a power of fallen boundless self awake between the first and the last nothingness so he, you can imagine the uh, the scale on which he is talking right from the first to the last <laughs> okay so recalling the tenebrous womb from which it came the last nothingness it recalls the tenebrous womb from which it came turned from the insoluble mystery of birth how can birth come out of something which is dead so that's a mystery this is a great mystery how can it happen <laughs> okay so today i read a thing on the internet and it said if this world came out of nothing who created the nothing <laughs> that's right <laughs> that's what children also ask okay so mm -hmm. there was one child who asked uh, uh, her mother who created the world her uh, mother asked is god who created the world so next question is who created god okay it's a funny story but the more you think about it really it is a very big puzzle how did god originate he has, does he have an origin how did he come into being and so perfect <laughs> so this is something mind boggling when you think about it from the beginning some he is there everything is created in the world so who created him <laughs> that's why you have to use the words self existent he doesn't depend upon he creates but he is himself uncreated that's the whole thing <clears throat> even your soul is described as unborn it is eternal <laughs> so this eternity is when you think about it at our level it's really a puzzle <laughs> and then we have twice in savitri self born yes that's right both referring to savitri and to ashwapati yes self born means he, he creates himself that will also be the power of the supramental being they will be able to create themselves they are not created but they will be able to create themselves and also dissolve their own existence okay so turn from the insoluble mystery of birth and the tardy process of mortality so if mortality is there obviously the question of life comes up and life is a tardy process so he has used the word mortality to mean life <laughs> that but it's a slow growth first there was only matter and then slowly over millions of years life came up okay so that's what could, he meaning could we look at the ending of the pair, uh, the full stop a fathomless zero occupied the world then he speaks of this power yeah of fallen boundless self could you elaborate on that a fathomless zero no what this power is 
between the first oh, and the last nothingness. Okay, the foreign boundless self. Okay, so at the highest level is Satchidananda. But Satchidananda, when it creates the world, it has to necessarily create it by falling and reducing its own power, consciousness, substance and ananda. It has to reduce. Why? That's why he is using the word fallen. Okay? So, why is it necessary to... All creation is necessarily a diminution. I usually uh, give to myself the... Mm, the mm, the image of a vast amount of clay. Okay? Let's think of a vast amount of clay which is infinite. But it has no forms. It's a formless mass. But it has the potentiality to create forms. It can create forms. It can create cups, plates, vessels and all it can create. But how do you create forms from the vast mass of clay, you have to take a little bit and give it a form. So when you take a little bit, what are you doing? You are taking from the infinite and making it a finite form. So all manifestation implies limitation of form. And limitation of what? Of Satchidananda. So limitation of consciousness, limitation of power, limitation also of Ananda. That's why he's using the word fallen. From the highest levels, it has to fall down to the absolute degree of zero. That's why the word fallen is there. Okay? So, a fathomless zero occupied the world. A power of fallen, boundless self awake. So, it's a power. But the power has fallen down to absolutely the lowest level. But it is awake. Yes. It's awake in a somnambulist way. Because if it is not awake, if it's an absolute zero, it can't produce anything. But it's a power that has been, has fallen, and it's a divine power. Therefore, it wants to go back to where it came from, like a jack-in-the-box. <laughs> so that's why this is the meaning of the word. Foreign, boundless self, awake. And it is awake where? Between the first and the last nothingness. So, Awakening, consciousness is there from here to there. Seems to be zero at this level, seems to be infinite at this level, but the zero and the infinite are both nothing. In this sense, that it is formless, featureless, infinite, eternal. Both are the same. The inconscient as well as the superconscient, both are. The first and the last nothingness. That's what it meant. Recalling the tenebrous womb from which it came. So, the tenebrous womb is the inconscient. It is dark, it is tenebrous, but it's also a womb. It has the potentiality of creating life. That's why the womb. Every word, if you examine, you will see he is describing the whole, uh, what he has said in Life Divine. <laughs> okay, so... Turned from the insoluble mystery of birth and the tardy process of mortality. So first there is birth and what is give, uh, being born? Life. So, interesting what he has used. Instead of saying life, he has used process of mortality. When life comes up, mortality also is coming up automatically. Until at the last, even the mortality will be conquered. Life will only be there without mortality. That's what he's saying. Okay, so. And longed to reach its end in vacant knot. The vacant knot is the experience of the nirvana, which is the Buddhistic uh, aim of life, to go and erase yourself completely. Okay, so vacant knot. Vacant again, meaning zero, okay, and without any features. Something which is vacant can be without features. But that which is without features can have two characters. It can really be a zero capable of producing nothing. 
because there is nothing in it. But it can also be a featureless nothing which has the potentiality to produce everything. So this power then it's awake between yes, this first that's and right. But it's, it wants to end itself yes. in vacant naught. Yes. And um, uh, he has used uh, this, uh, the whole epic is written in iambic pentameter. That means each line has got five feet. And usually he tries to keep small sentences. It goes only to two or three lines each, or sometimes four or five maximum. But always you'll see that a full stop is coming after every four or five uh, lines. So short sentences and sometimes standalone lines. Each line can stand by itself. Okay, he has said that. In fact, there is a hundred pages of commentaries by Sri Ramdo on Savitri, and that's another interesting story which you should know also. Okay, as I said, Savitri was started long ago. Okay. It began, but he, at that time he never had the idea that it would end up like this. Okay, He just started it. And when he was in Pondicherry, he was encouraging everyone to write poetry. And uh, Amal was one of those who was had a poetic uh, tendency. And he was asking him, um, Srimad used to send inspiration to people. They, I, I should mention this. It is from those inspiration which people used to receive and write down. Okay, it's not their own creation. Most of the poetry written by all Neruda as well as uh, Amal Kiran, as well as um, uh, uh, oh, Arjava, 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 Arjava also. Oh yeah, fantastic poetry, all of them. But it was from those inspiration which he was sending to them. The proof is. That Neruda is saying to Sri Ramdo, why aren't you sending me inspiration? So Sri Ramdo says, okay, tell me when do you sit for writing poetry? I will see what I can do. So what does it mean? It means that now he is sitting and he is ready to receive, I will send it to him. So he is very clearly sending <laughs> poetry. And after Sri Ramdo passed away, no more poetry of all these people. They stopped writing, no inspiration. So, <laughs> so this is the, yeah, so. Near, uh, Amal used to ask him questions all about poetry and all that. And Sremdo said that some some of the poetry comes from the psychic, some comes from the inner vital, some come from the spiritual planes of consciousness, some from the higher mind, human mind, intuitive mind, and all. And these he called overhead poetry. Okay. So Sremdo he wrote to Sremdo, can you give me some examples of overhead poetry? So Sivamdha said, okay, I'll send you some. And he sent him the first lines from Savitri. And, but he said, don't reveal it to anybody. So Nalida was the messenger. So it used to be a sealed envelope. And Nalida used to take it and give it to Amal. But Nalida being Nalida, he was curious as to what is in that envelope? Why is Sivamdha sending this in a sealed envelope? So he asked Amal, you know, not in words, but <laughs> with a gesture. <laughs> what is there in it? So, Amal asked Sriyam though, that he is curious to know what is there. Should I tell him? <laughs> so then Sriyam says, you can tell him only him, but don't tell anybody else. So this developed into Savitri afterwards. It's fantastic. And so he used to go on sending these fascicules to Amal. And Amal had the temerity I must mention that also, to suggest changes. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. <laughs> and Srimdu never changed. Sometimes, very rarely, he would say, to satisfy him, he would change. But otherwise, he says, no, this inspiration is from a very high plane, no change is needed. <laughs> so, he fixed the minimum level of inspiration for Savitri from the overmind plane of consciousness. And some of them from the supermind, supermental level, <laughs> because he had established a contact. <laughs> okay, so these are interesting stories, and that's why all these letters which he has explained, what is this, what is that, and all that, is it's eighty to ninety pages of comments on in Sabbath. the future poetry. Uh, yes, letters on 
And letters on That's poetry right. and art. Yes. yes, that volume is there. And on that, the section dealing with Savitri is quite long. <laughs> so, if people are interested or get stuck there, you can refer to the letters and you may get your solution. But it's a vast, vast, vast epic. So, you may not get the solution also. We are looking at the meaning part. I am not. I told you about the mantric part, but that's entirely up to the individual. When you are reading Savitri, read it. Best is to read it before you go to bed, because then you have a, a very good, you are in the right atmosphere and you will not go into wrong uh, regions of the vital and others when you sleep. Okay. Otherwise, the danger of going into wrong areas of the vital is there. Okay. So, We'll go a few more lines, we'll finish and then we'll, we'll see where we have to stop. So we read up to the tardy process of mortality. So, interesting the way Sri Ramdu writes. He's saying that life came into from the inconscient, but it's a very slow process and along with life, mortality also is. When you say mortality, obviously it also means that there is something which is life. Mortality has to exist only with life. So he's saying the tardy process of mortality, meaning life, okay, and long to reach its end in vacant not. <laughs> vacant not is the self, the nirvana experience. Okay. As in a dark beginning of all things, a mute, featureless semblance of the unknown, repeating forever the unconscious act prolonging forever the unseeing will, cradled the cosmic drowse of ignorant force whose moved creative slumber kindles the suns and carries our lives in its somnambulist world. So this whole thing, he is showing how it is the inconscient. Okay, so, but it is, A womb it produces. A mute featureless. No, he is beginning with as in a dark beginning of all things. The beginning of all things is dark. Okay. Um, uh, he has also mentioned several times in the Vedas also Aprakitam Salilam, the dark waters of the infinite. Okay. So here also he is as in a dark beginning of all things, a mute Mute, obviously, no movement, no sound, no vibration. Featureless, semblance of the unknown. Semblance of the unknown. <laughs> okay. Repeating forever the unconscious act. You can see that repeating is also a very interesting uh, word he is using because there is a rhythm in the physical world which goes on repeating at all levels. There is a rhythm. In Life Divine, he uses the word rhythm. Yeah. If you look carefully, you will see that every movement in the physical world is a rhythm. Your heart is beating in rhythm. Day and night is rhythmic. The sun is going round, the earth is going around the sun in one year. There is a rhythm for everything. So the movement in the physical world, when it starts, when there is no movement, is inconstant. But when it starts, it is rhythmic. Repeating forever, okay, the unconscious act. What is being repeated is unconscious. In the beginning, it is unconscious. When life also is coming, it's automatic action, but it is unconscious. The and the word forever. Yes. Repeating forever. That's right. This process is going on even now. The inconscient is going on creating. It's an endless proce process. Creation is endless. There is no end to creation. How can we say that the forms which are being created have a limit? You can't say that. There can be infinite forms. Even now, new species are being born, new species of flora and fauna. It's going on. That's why the repetition, repeating forever, the unconscious act. Act of what? Creation. Prolonging forever the unseeing will the unseeing, but there is a will, but it is blind. He has explained this, what he means by this, that 
this super constant is there even in matter and that is why matter there is a consciousness hidden in matter so it is will but it is unseen it is sleeping he has used the word somnambulist half awake <laughs> okay so a thought the vain enormous trance of space again you can see the word trance when you are in trance you are not conscious of the world so it's a semi conscious state actually trance in your your consciousness above is in full consciousness but in the physical world when you are in a trance you are not aware of the physical world that again suggests the unconsciousness i asked timmy about a thwart Hmm. She said, "Moving from side right. to side, a thought across, like yeah, that. yeah, a thought. <clears throat> uh, a thought is a word used by sailors. It means sideways, across. Okay, it can also mean awkwardly and the wrong angle. Hmm. I've noted down the uh, meanings. A thought used by sailors." <laughs> mainly when the ship moves like that sideways okay so the vast enormous trance of space its formless stupor again he is stressing all the words are suggesting lack of creation but it's a womb it's an unseeing will which has gone to sleep so this is the description of the inconscient no movement no life nothing darkness yet it is capable of producing that's why he's using the word the insoluble mystery of birth something you cannot understand how is how can something dead produce something living that's a mystery and the mystery is solved when you understand that the inconscient has the power to reduce itself and become the opposite of itself god is not only omnipotence omnipresence and omniscience he can also be the opposite of all these things normally we would say god is necessarily omnipotent omniscient and omnipresent but that's not true <laughs> he can he has the power to become the opposite of himself okay so <clears throat> a shadow spinning through the soulless void again soulless there seems to be an absolute negation of the divine in the inconscient thrown back once more into unthinking dreams okay earth wheeled abandoned in the hollow gulfs forgetful of her spirit and her fate so here we have some questions yeah he's speaking now about earth yes that's right so so from the earth is inconscient turning. he has come to the earth <laughs> and what is this stupor formless stupor stupor is again when you are in a stupor you are unconscious and you are puzzled so the uh, the uh, suggestion is you are unconscious and yet there is a, a, a puzzlement you are uh, you are confused that's what it, the implication is there that's what the inconscient is all about <clears throat> So he he's telling us that uh, he's speaking of earth now. Yes, that's right. And this is the first time we've heard about that's earth. That's right. Okay. Until now he has been speaking of the infinite inconscient. Now he's speaking about the earth. Because after all, earth is only one small speck of matter compared to the universe. <laughs> so now he's focusing on the earth. Wheeled abandoned in the hollow gulfs forgetful of her spirit and her fate now note the word hollow gulfs even science will confirm that to you space is hollow and in that space you have all these constellations and galaxies and what not infinite and in all this scenery there is the small earth spinning around the sun in fact in life divine he has said he has described the earth if you view it in terms of the cosmos the infinite cosmos earth is nothing but a, a speck of dust with water in it <laughs> this is described that in the life divine like that it is nothing but a mere speck of dust 
that's the vastness that he's describing here. You can feel that sense of vastness in these lines. Okay. So, forgetful of her spirit and her fate. The impassive skies were neutral, empty, still. This is a one line sentence. Okay. The impassive skies. Impassive, not being affected by anything. No emotion, nothing at all. Absolutely static. And he's talking of the skies, neutral, empty, still. Then something in the inscrutable darkness stirred. Now this is the, he has been speaking of immobility. Now the creation starts from the inconscient. So there is a stirring. Okay? And the inscrutable means impossible to understand or interpret. That's the word, meaning of the word inscrutable, impossible to understand. So, in the inscrutable darkness stirred, something, movement started. A nameless movement, an unthought idea. <laughs> Ideas are thought, but he's saying it's an unthought idea. What does it mean? It means the possibility of mind also, it can suggest. Because it's the mind that thinks, is the ideas. Ideas are not there in the vital. They are there in the thought, in the mind. So, but unthought idea, <laughs> not yet taken form, not yet taken shape. <clears throat> Insistent, dissatisfied, without an aim, something that wished but knew not how to be. Tease the inconscient to wake ignorance. So there's a the, as you said, the in idea of involution, the superconscient reduces itself, diminishes itself and becomes the inconscient and hides in it. But because it is divine in essence, it doesn't want to be imprisoned, so it wants to break out. So it's a urge to break out without knowing where it is going. That's what he's saying. Okay? Tease the inconscience to wake ignorance. Ignorance is again darkness. Okay? So, start moving. Go to knowledge. It is pushing. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, we'll end there today. Namaste all. Thank you.